When most people hear that Voyager 1 left the solar system, it sounds like a simple, final moment. One day, the probe is inside. The next day, it crosses an invisible line, and suddenly, it's out there, wandering among the stars forever. It's a bold headline, but the reality is much stranger and much larger than that. Today, Voyager 1 is over 15.7 billion kilometers from the Sun, around 169 astronomical units. That's more than four times Neptune's distance. It has already crossed the heliopause, the boundary where the solar wind loses strength and gives way to the extremely thin gas between stars. But if we define the solar system as the entire region where the sun's gravity still holds on to the icy leftovers from the system's birth, then Voyager hasn't left home at all. It's still well within an invisible sphere of comets called the Oort Cloud, which extends to nearly a light year away. So, where does the solar system really end? To answer that, the first thing is to accept a slightly uncomfortable truth. Solar system doesn't have a single perfect definition. There are at least three different ways to use the term, and each one gives a different answer. One definition looks at sunlight and the charged particles it emits. The sun constantly blows a stream of particles called the solar wind. That wind carries the sun's magnetic field and carves out a kind of bubble inside the surrounding interstellar gas. This bubble is the heliosphere. If you ask a scientist who studies the sun where the solar system ends, there's a good chance they'll point to the edge of that bubble, the heliopause, as the end. A second definition focuses on gravity. The sun's gravity, in theory, extends to infinity. In practice, there's a region around it where its pull is stronger than the combined tugs of neighboring stars and the galaxy itself. Within this region, small icy bodies can remain bound to the sun in gigantic orbits for billions of years. This gravitational domain is much larger than the heliosphere and, for many astronomers, is a deeper way to define what still belongs to the solar system. A third, very practical definition looks at where the sun's material actually is. From this point of view, the solar system is the collection of planets, moons, asteroids, comets, dwarf planets, and all the rest of the cosmic debris that formed in the protoplanetary disk, and that remains in some way bound to the sun's gravity today. All of these definitions are useful and overlap, but they don't end at the same distance. That's why the question, have we left the solar system, is both simple and misleading. Before going to the farthest edge, it's worth anchoring our intuition in the part of the solar system we know best. If we start at the sun and head outward, the first familiar milestone is Earth, one astronomical unit away, about 150 million kilometers. Then come Mars, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, and Saturn. When we reach Neptune, we're at about 30 astronomical units. Pluto's orbit goes farther, getting close to 50 astronomical units at its most distant point. This region, roughly 30 to 50 astronomical units, is the Kuiper Belt. For many people, the solar system seems to end there, at the last planet, followed by a ring of small, icy bodies. But even at that point, we're already walking through a leftover's yard. The Kuiper Belt is a debris disk beyond Neptune, with dwarf planets like Pluto, Haumea, and Makemake, and countless smaller objects. It is, in a way, the rubble left over from the construction of the giant planets. Beyond the Kuiper Belt, objects become rarer, and their orbits more elongated and tilted. This region, sometimes called the scattered disk, begins the transition to something much larger and more mysterious, the inner part of the Oort cloud. And this is where the scale really gets out of hand. To feel that scale, it's worth bringing Voyager back into the story. Voyager 1 was launched in 1977 for a grand tour of the outer planets. After flying by Jupiter and Saturn, it picked up speed and was placed on an escape trajectory that would take it out of the planetary region. Along the way, it crossed key structures of the heliosphere. In 2004, it crossed the termination shock, 
where the solar wind abruptly slows as it begins to encounter interstellar gas. After that, it entered the Helios Heath, a turbulent region where the solar wind becomes compressed and distorted. On August 25, 2012, Voyager 1 crossed the heliopause. There, the pressure of the solar wind finally loses to the pressure of the interstellar medium. On the inside, the plasma is dominated by particles coming from the sun. On the outside, the density of charged particles rises in a different way, and cosmic rays from the galaxy grow more intense. Voyager's instruments recorded an abrupt change in the amount and type of particles, along with a change in the behavior of the magnetic field. These were the signals indicating that the probe had, at last, entered interstellar space. Voyager 2 repeated this crossing in 2018, at a slightly different distance from the Sun. This showed that the heliosphere is not a perfect sphere, but a somewhat squashed bubble, pushed by the gas around it, and by the Sun's motion through the galaxy. If we define the solar system as the region filled by the solar wind, then yes, when Voyager 1 passed the heliopause, it left the solar system. Technically, it is in interstellar space, but the sun's gravity reaches far beyond the heliopause, and so do the objects still orbiting the sun. To understand this deeper structure, we need to zoom out even more. Astronomers believe that in the early days of the solar system, when the giant planets were still migrating and disturbing the debris disk, many icy bodies were flung outward. Some gained enough speed to escape entirely and became interstellar objects. Others were thrown into extremely long, slow orbits that carry them tens of thousands of astronomical units from the Sun before bringing them back. Over billions of years, the random tugs of passing stars and the gravitational field of the Milky Way itself scrambled these orbits, forming a nearly spherical cloud around the solar system. This is the Oort cloud, named after Dutch astronomer Jan Oort. We've never seen it directly. Its existence is inferred from the behavior of long-period comets, those that appear in the inner solar system from random directions, with orbits that can last hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. The most natural way to explain these orbits is to assume there's an enormous reservoir of icy bodies that begins around two or three thousand astronomical units from the sun and may extend to nearly 100,000 astronomical units. It's estimated that the main inner edge of this cloud lies between about 2,000 and 5,000 astronomical units and that the outer edge could reach the tens of thousands of astronomical units perhaps something like 50,000, 80,000, maybe 100,000 astronomical units. That outer limit sits at roughly a light year and a half away. Beyond that, the gravity of other stars and of the galaxy itself weighs more than the sun's pull, and objects are stolen more easily. Within this gigantic volume, researchers often distinguish a denser and relatively more compact part called the inner Oort cloud, or Hills Cloud, and a more diffuse, almost spherical region called the Outer Oort Cloud. Recent high-performance simulations even suggest that this inner cloud may not be as smooth as many imagined. In some models, it takes the shape of a spiral structure, like a bar with arms, molded by the combination of the sun's gravity and the galaxy's gravitational field. In other words, at the extreme outskirts of the solar system, the geometry may be much stranger than the perfect circle of textbook diagrams. On any scale model, this is where everything falls apart. If you draw the sun and planets on a sheet of paper, you might mark Earth at one unit, Neptune at 30 units, and the Kuiper belt out to 50 units. On the same scale, the inner edge of the Oort cloud would sit at 2,000 units. The outer edge could be at 100,000, in that drawing, the entire region of the planets and the Kuiper belt would be a tiny dot at the center of the page. That's why many astronomers, and even NASA's own outreach materials, treat the Oort cloud as the true frontier of the solar system. The logic is simple. As long as these comets are, 
on average, bound to the sun's gravity, they are part of our system. Beyond them, other stars take over. If we accept that definition, where is Voyager relative to this cloud? Voyager 1 is traveling at around 17 kilometers per second relative to the sun, which is about 3.5 to 4 astronomical units per year. By common estimates, if it keeps going, it will take roughly 300 years to reach the significant inner edge of the Oort cloud and on the order of 30,000 years to cross it completely. In other words, what we often call leaving the solar system is just the first small step of a journey that will last longer than all of recorded human history. Even this estimate is full of uncertainties. The extent, shape, and total mass of the Oort cloud depend on models that are still being refined. The very idea of a spiral structure in the inner cloud shows that the boundary may be more diffuse and odd than a clear edge. But whatever the model, they all agree on one point. The real size of our cosmic home is far larger than the planetary region. There's yet another detail hidden in the question. If we zoom out far enough, the Sun and its Oort cloud are just one stellar system among many, all orbiting together within the Milky Way's disk. The space between the Oort cloud and the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, isn't empty. It's filled with rarefied gas, dust, magnetic fields, and probably the comet clouds of other stars, too. The point where the solar system ends and the galaxy begins isn't a sharp wall, but a gradual transition of gravitational influences. At some radius, the combined pull of the galaxy and of passing stars will definitively strip comets from the Oort cloud. Beyond that, it makes less and less sense to say an object belongs to the sun. This is the practical limit many people use. Beyond the outer edge of the Oort cloud, the sun's family thins out into the galaxy's interstellar space. Voyager will keep moving in that direction for millions of years, long after its nuclear power sources are spent, long after its instruments have stopped working, long after Earth has changed completely. The little probe and its golden record will still be on their way, crossing in slow motion, that invisible limit where the sun's family of objects gives way to the Milky Way's multitude of stars. So, in the end, have we left the solar system? If you define the solar system as the sphere of space filled by the solar wind, bounded by the heliopause, then yes. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are in interstellar space. They are measuring, right now, the density and magnetic field of the medium between the stars. If you define the solar system as the region of the major planets, the answer is subtler. Voyager left that region decades ago. It's far beyond Neptune and Pluto. By that criterion, it has been outside the solar system for a long time. But if you define the solar system as the realm where the sun still holds the icy remnants of its birth, then the story is just beginning. Voyager is still well within that gravitational bubble. The most notable inner edge of the Oort cloud is thousands of astronomical units away. The probe has covered only a tiny fraction of that path. Perhaps the most honest answer is to admit there isn't a single sharp border. There are layers of boundaries, each telling a different chapter of the same story. First, we left Earth's atmosphere. Then we escaped our planet's gravity. We crossed Mars's orbit, then Jupiter's, then Neptune's. We passed through the Kuiper belt. We broke through the sun's magnetic bubble and entered interstellar space. One day, far beyond our civilization, the descendants of Voyager will pass the last comet that can still, with some honesty, be called a member of the solar system. Only then, in a deep gravitational sense, will they truly have left home. For us, perhaps the most surprising discovery is psychological. When we talk about home, we usually think of continents, countries, perhaps a small blue planet. In practice, the true size of our home stretches to almost halfway between the sun and the next star. The solar system doesn't end right after Neptune. It gradually dissolves into the galaxy, across distances so vast 
that not even our fastest spacecraft can cross them in less than tens of thousands of years. As Voyager continues its slow passage through that dark, invisible frontier, it carries a reminder. Our story isn't anchored only to a planet, but to an entire star and its whole sphere of influence. The edge of the solar system isn't just a line to be crossed. It's a question of scale to be understood. And the more we learn, the more that edge quietly retreats into the deep night surrounding our little cosmic home. So, if you made it this far, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. That tells YouTube this content is worth it and helps these videos reach more people who love astronomy like you. And tell me in the comments, for you, at which of these frontiers can we really say the solar system ends? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.